It's about 40 minutes past the hour of 7 o'clock in the morning. My name is Priva Elibaz. Welcome back to Twitter. J from Twitter Jabs 1, this is Twitter Jabs 2. And right now I'm seated down with Mrs. Christine Berinjiro, who is the program manager for the Uganda Debt Network, as well as Mr. Alan Muhereza, who is the uh, team leader for the Youth for Tax Justice Network. Good morning, lady and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank so uh, earlier on in our Twitter jobs one, we did carry the conversation on Uganda's uh, debt status at the moment and how, you know, we looked at the issue of sustainability, how we're being going to be able to service, uh, service it as a country and so forth and so forth. So my very first question is going to go to you, Christine. What are your thoughts about Uganda's uh, debt increasing from 73 trillion shillings to 77 trillion shillings? Are we safe as a country? Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, once again, good morning, viewers. Uh, well, about Uganda's uh, debt and sustainability, it is true, it is uh, fast becoming sustainable, and uh, it is good, it's a good step, uh, personally, I think, that government comes out and is honest with the citizens and says, hey, look, now our debt is clearly unsustainable because over time we have always uh, put out the red flags, you know, the sustainability of our debt and questions, and government has always been in denial. But uh, how did we get here in the first place? Yeah, Because you remember uh, during the hippic days, 1996, 2006, when we, under the highly indebted poor countries initiative uh, and the multilateral uh, a debt relief initiative where Uganda obtained total forgiveness of her external debt. And yes, it was written off, but of course uh, with a condition that you should invest these resources to address the poverty situation in the country. Uh, but fast forward, even after that forgiveness, fast forward, we are in 2022 20, now, and the debt is, you know, threatening. Unfortunately, <coughs> we cannot uh, go for forgiveness again. That one is out because the, the, the structure of our debt now is so different. While uh, those days the multilaterals could write off your debt and forgive you, over time we have, uh, we have contracted more non-concessional debt, yes, which mm -hmm. is commercial. The China, I, I saw you talking about the Chinese debt and ATC. So these are commercial debts. They are profit oriented and so they will not lose out. Unfortunately, they are usually expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, they are short term. And so you find that, but they are also attractive. You get huge sums of money to invest in whatever, in your development aspirations, to construct your roads, your dams and ETC. Mm -hmm. But, and they are not bad in themselves. The only problem is if you acquire such debt and then you eat it. By eat it, I mean you, the corruption. It, yes, you do not way. put it to its use. Mm -hmm. That means you're going to, you know, like uh, squeeze your population to be able to pay back. And so that is where we have reached. And that is why we have reached here. Of course, it is all compounded by COVID. But really, it is just an excuse. It's COVID an excuse. comes in as an excuse because, well, uh, just as an example, 2019, December, that was shortly before COVID, mm. our public debt was uh, at uh, 49 trillion. But just one year later, December 2020, we were at 65 trillion. That is about 36% increase. increase yeah. And right now, we are at, uh, we are at 74 according to the Bank of Uganda, yes. right now, as of April 2022, yes. And so we see that um, even with this uh, level of debt unsustainability, we see our behavior or our consumption or our, you know, uh, investment is really not uh, frugal, is not reflecting the times we have I've had you talk about the MPs' uh, emoluments, yes. the salaries already they are, you know, in millions and millions of shillings. You have the cars, cars the vehicles, mm. 200 million, and yet you're saying our people in Karamoja, how many have died? Of Over 100, yeah? <coughs> and so it begs the question of, even with the situation that we are in, have we learned anything? 
yeah, because we are saying our debt is unsustainable. Uh, Honorable Amos Lugolovi comes out and says, hey, we are at now 54% debt to GDP. And then Honorable Matia Kasaija comes in and says, but you know, pay more taxes if you want. But we all know that if you're not, I'll just use the analogy of a cow. Mm. If you have a cow and that is your source of livelihood, you get milk from it. If you do not feed, feed it, it well, enough, yeah. you will not, you know, get the milk. Get the milk. Mm -hmm. So even if you want to get as more tax, so many taxes, if you are not investing in your in your economy, if you're not boosting the private sector, then you're not going to be able to get the taxes, taxes that you're, you're asking for. for. Yes. Well, Mr. Mher is a finance minister. Matia Kasaija says, in order for the government to stop borrowing, Ugandans need to pay more taxes. In your view, how plausible is this? Um, I, uh, good morning to our viewers um, and thank you for having me once again. I want to start uh, from a point that uh, debt in itself is not bad and no one should say that we are against borrowing. I think even at a personal level of people that have grown and what people have borrowed to a certain extent, even countries, there are countries that have debt of over 200 percent of their GDP, Japan, um, Germany has all, over 100 percent and all that. So. I don't want the viewers to think that uh, we are against date, that date per se. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Ms. Uh, Chris, um, mm -hmm. Christine talked about it, of why we are borrowing. That's the biggest question. Uh, but also, I think it will go back to um, how do governments raise resources to finance their development. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, if, and I think where the, the, the minister is coming from is that since we've not been able to raise taxes then as government to cover its deficit it has to go and then borrow and all that and i think for us that's where i think we have to come in and say okay why hasn't government been raising enough resources is it that people are not paying or is it that um uh, the tax is out there and is not being collected by government. So th I think um, the interrogation should be as to why um, we still have a low tax to GDP ratio of about 13% um, and yet other countries um, that have been able to um, develop, they've had more, um, more, more, more tax raised. So I think the problem is not that people are not paying. I, actually, for me, from where I come from, I think the problem is that the government is not collecting enough tax as it should. As it should. Because the tax is actually out there. And I think uh, some of the times we've, had, we've discussed this before, even before we go to um, the effects of date, uh, because the numbers may really um, hide the actual, picture, yeah. the, the actual picture. The question that would be, um, when what happens when government borrows uh, we know that for example leave alone the fact that um, you have more debt but the fact that as you saw this year's budget 17 trillion is going to debt repayment and servicing now 17 trillion is having the budget of education health agriculture combined all together yes all together to have that so those are the actual real effects of debt to say that um, instead of spending more on sectors that are critical to human development, sectors that are critical to having people go out and work, having people go out to give you what, uh, what was saying that to, to, to feed the cow, we are now spending most of our money, our tax, because even that money that, <laughs> the seven trillion that we are paying is partly, we are borrowing to pay debt, but also we are taxing people to pay debt. So I think th those are some of the real human costs. But me, to come back to why, if it's feasible, I think uh, first government has to do what it's supposed to do, to tax, to look for the money where it is. And I usually give very, um, very, very simple examples. We can start with um, the, the, the incentives regime, the tax incentives regime. Mm -hmm. You see um, who is not paying and why are they not paying? If we can solve that, and then uh, what Mr. Kasaja is talking about becomes really, um, uh, it is not us that we are not paying. And I'll give an example. Um, there, are, there are companies in this country that have never paid tax in 25 years, but you're in an economy, you're a multinational, because you see, the starting point is that as a multinational company, some of these companies have annual profits that are bigger than our GDP, <laughs> all combined. 
and then you come and then say to a such company that don't pay tax for the next 10 years. Tax exemption, and, yes. Yes, yes. You say don't pay tax because you're going to give our young people jobs, you're going to do this. And then after 10 years, we don't see the jobs. You've not paid. And then we are now required to, um, to now borrow and then tax ourselves to pay, to pay that debt. So I think that's where we should start from. And I think this is the advice I would give the minister that let's first look for the money where it is. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, there is something that the IGD said some time back and she got a blowback of, uh, we can start with simple things like lifestyle audits. If there is someone that can spend 31 million in a bar, Mm -hmm. in one night mm -hmm. the question should be how much have they paid in their taxes right because that means that actually they, are, mm -hmm. they have the resources <laughs> if we see people um uh, we've seen people that have come and splashed money and the question would be uh, and i usually drive on the roads and so on the roads where you see a car worth 500 million on the road the question is if someone is driving a car of 500 million how much is he paying in taxes so we could start with some of those because at the end of the day actually the money is there government is just mm -hmm. not taxing people yes well christine <laughs> in relation to accountability do you think as a country we've actually used the board money properly mm. yeah um i think i also want to start from where he stopped okay, please. Uh, personally while mm. i believe that uh, true government mm. should explore uh, you know, revenue generation, strength and revenue generation. But I believe that if you go to fetch water, for instance, at a well, and you have a port that has maybe some holes, okay, it is leaking. Mm -hmm. However much water you fetch, mm -hmm. you will not reach home with some water because it will all leak along the way. So even as we look at, you know, mm -hmm. you can increase the revenues that you want, you can borrow all you want, if at the receiving end mm. there are no checks and balances, you're just fetching and putting into a leaking port. Uh, the IG, yes, mm. uh, he mentioned, came out, I think it was last year. She said government loses about nine trillion every year mm. in corruption. Yeah, that is what she said. Mm -hmm. Look at our budget, 2022-23. Uh, mm. We have uh, about uh, 500 billion for agriculture. We have about 1.5 trillion for agro-industrialization. And remember, this is a sector that we say uh, maybe employs about 70% or more of the population. Uh, education is about 4, 4 trillion. Um, health is about three. And all these three sectors combined, okay, sub-programs now, mm will are uh, even less than what we are losing annually just imagine if we were to save the nine trillion plus mm -hmm. how much more how much would we be able to fi finance our what our mm -hmm. sectors our development and etc mm -hmm. uh, uh, th there are quite a number of cases but just as a sample last week i think it was last week when the deputy speaker after the, the Karamoja incident of people dying, he came out and said Uganda, or MPs, parliament, approved a loan of about uh, 10 million euros, mm. that was two years ago, mm. for rehabilitation of health centers in Karamoja. Karamoja. But from the time of approval up to now, there is nothing on the ground. Yeah? And this is a loan that we are supposed to pay back. But no one knows what Where, happened. What happened to you know, the money? MPs stop at approving two years down the road. And these are our representatives. We expect that they're in touch. Yeah? You know what is happening. Even before the hunger situation gets out of control, before the 100, when one person, two people, three, when they were dying, we, will th we want to think that, you know, as the area MP, you know and you raise this red flag in parliament. Yes. You're not going to wait for the report from the development partners to raise, you know. And so this begs the question of accountability, the oversight role. Where are we? Government is, I don't like using such words, but government seems to be sleeping <laughs> and they are letting us down. They're letting us down. Yes, we don't see some of these, you know, you know, uh, the, the, the World Bank came out with a report some time back, that was in 2016, and they said for every dollar invested in Uganda, we recoup about uh, seven-tenths of a dollar, that is less than a dollar, 
Mm. Yeah. But for the US, that uh, for every dollar they invested, they generated about six dollars worth, and mm. that was way back, like around 2000, mm. 2001. Mm. And so when we are talking about, um, he, he also uh, hinted on it, when we are saying Uganda's debt to GDP is 54%, mm. and uh, the US is at 134%, mm. you, these are some of the things we are looking at. You actually should look at debt to revenue. Mm. Why the difference? And why is it that uh, when Sri Lanka goes to maybe uh, uh, the GDP hits 100, 100 I think, and 8, then they're in debt distress. But these ones are still standing. These are some of the issues. Are your revenues enough to address or to pay back the debt? Yeah. How are you behaving when you get this debt? How do you use it? Mm. So these are some of the issues. Yeah, We see that there's been a lot of wastage. But beyond that, there's quite some denial from government because we see they're not being genuine and honest uh, in, 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 in sharing the full debt uh, picture. We know there are some contingent liabilities. You have uh, um, uh, quite a number of, you know, like land compensations. There are quite a number of, uh, of, of, of obligations yes. Yes. that are not compiled within uh, the debt, you know, public debt picture. And so why don't we come out? Because the Auditor General's report, 2021, uh, he noted that contingent liabilities have grown by 1,000% in just one year, in just one year. And from 11 trillion to about 69 trillion. That is alarming. If all this were to be compiled within the debt, then we are not doing well off. We are not well off, yeah? So I think, yes, we need to be honest. We need to be accountable. We need to be transparent. But we also need to be, maybe I should call it patriotic, yeah. the people who are in charge of contracting the debt on behalf of the country are also not doing us, you know, uh, justice. They're doing us a disservice. Yes, because yeah. uh, you go to contract debt, I'll give an example of China, and the loan conditions that these loans come with. Sometimes even us as laymen or laywomen, you just look on and you're like, wow. Because this is a loan that is coming, maybe partly uh, it is going to be given in kind. Mm. They are going to, to come, uh, maybe the, 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 the Chinese government or whoever is giving you the loan is going to give you the, the, the machinery if it is an infrastructure need, development yeah. loan and they'll bring some of the labor and so you find uh, you have not benefited so much at the end of the day and yet you're paying so much out. Yeah. yeah. So a case for transparency, yes. A case for for prudent acquisition, management, and oversight in all these processes is very key. It's very very key. Well, Mr. Muhereza, in 2018, Minister Matia Kasaija revealed that the government borrowed money to pay uh, salaries for civil servants and public servants as part of a directive, you know, uh, under the social assistant. Um, grants empowerment program that was for the elderly yes and to are you gonna out there is it justifiable to actually borrow money to pay these salaries well um i as i as i think as government um when they borrow and i think this is a conversation we had with imf sometime when they were talking about giving uganda money for covid 19 when they were um, approving the one billion when we were asking them that can we make sure that this money does not go into spending uh, recurrent expenditure. And, and what they said was that um, for them, when they give money, they give it to budget support. So, and once government has put it in, um, in budget allocation, they have little or no control on where uh, the money goes. So that goes back to the intentions and um, the will of government to use that money for whatever it's um, is using it for but uh, at of, of course uh, for recurrent expenditure is expenditure that you know will happen uh, of course the, the other time we're here and we're talking about the national planning authority the uh, parliament and what but 
if you know that someone is this is how much you spend let me say on salaries or not that is something that goes to planning it doesn't have to be even an issue of date because like we said uh, uganda even with the numerous challenges that we're having we are we are able to collect about 25 trillion uganda shillings really if you've been planning very well you cannot say that you've not planned to have um, this paid uh, in terms of development expenditure or recurrent expenditure so i think that is just a, a planning issue on the side of government they, they, their priorities i don't think uh whether they there should be i wanted to um, touch on something that um i think um she talked about about accountability about transparency uh, but me, when I when, when we discuss that, especially as young people, because now me, I, I was telling people recently that we should not have ministers that are eight years old borrowing money to be paid back in fifty years, and we don't have a say in such in such transactions. Unfortunately, our representatives in parliament have not done a good job. But of course, it could be issues of capacity. It could be issues of um, understanding some of these issues, but. The idea is that uh, young people should be involved. And when we talk about um, accountability, I want to give an example in Kenya. When they were discussing uh, give, getting money for COVID-19, Kenyans um, went on social media and what, and they said, if IMF wants to give us money, it should send it to our m -Pesa. Like, they should not give it to government for government then to allocate it to they said no uh, we, almost 90 percent kenya has 90 percent phone penetration and of those 90 percent um most of them have so they said and this is what uh, i think it means when we say we need accountability as young people as ordinary people it's not enough to say that we borrowed money to the road is the road there and there are people that you can ask and talk to uh, at a personal level as your representatives because it is taking away agents from them to say they go to parliament, they pass these loans, and then for some reason after two years, uh, nothing mm -hmm. has been done. There is recently, um, I think it was last year when CSBA came up with a report that about from about 30, I think there were 32 loans that had been contracted in a period of, um, I think, five years. Ten of those... Um, disbursement had not happened but we had already started um, paying interest on them I the money was still in the bank there had been no feasibility studies they had been mm -hmm. not what people just went to got money and then uh, 10 years a uh, few years later three four years later we have started repaying and then the money has not been remember so me I think then it was and in some of the challenges when we talk about accountability I think we should also look at um, the creditor's responsibility in this case. And this is where I think young people and organizations like UDN can yeah. help. That yeah. you as the person giving us money, when you know, because they've done this for human rights. I think IMF World Bank has said if there are human rights violations in any way, we are not going to give you money. If there are um, certain... Uh, conditions we, when it comes to these conditions, whether it's human rights, whether it's what, they've set certain conditions that have made governments more accountable because in situations whereby you cannot even have a demonstration, a rally somewhere and what, sometimes we have to look at the creditor's responsibility. And I'll give an example <coughs> again for Kenya or even, even here in Uganda. I remember the, the, there was a scan of euro bonds in Kenya. Kenya went to borrow about 800 euros and was able to raise 2 billion. Now, as a creditor, someone came for 800 million and you gave them 2 billion. Of course, there's going to be mismanagement. There's going to be theft. There's going to, because they've not planned for the extra 1.2 billion that you've given them. So, and as young people, as legislators, we should also task um, creditors, especially for those that <laughs> give money when they really know uh, that this money is not going to be used for uh, what it's, it's, we say it's going to be used for. Um, and then I think lastly and i think this came out um, um within last year's uh, african conference on data and development uh, there is a declaration the Harari declaration where we said that uh, we should also not discuss date in abstract date like we should be asking ourselves if our loans were forgiven 2005 to zero how is it that in um, less than 20 years we go from zero percent to 54 percent yeah. is it that we are so rich that everyone is willing to <laughs> lend us 
Is it that um, <laughs> every case we make for date um, is a case that is agreeable? Because th those are some of the things we also have to question, that um, for the people that are lending us money, what is the magic um, if, if, if I'm defaulting? Or, okay, let's say I'm not defaulting because sometimes we borrow to pay back, <laughs> to pay back money and then we tax people and then we, uh, as a government, put austerity measures, you cut on health, you cut on education, you cut everywhere so that you can pay. Like I said, this year's budget, the biggest, biggest portion of our budget this year went to debt repayment and servicing, 17 trillion. So it means that um, at, at a minimum, we should ask as African governments, as African young people, what is the instrument of debt in our development agenda? Why is it that everyone is willing to lend us money, even when they know we may not be able to pay back, even when they know that this money is going to be misappropriated? You know, most of the money that she was talking about has been borrowed for infrastructure. And I've always said that Bam Gamarere, when she was probing UNRWA, said that out of seven trillion that had been given, four had been stolen. But this is money we are borrowing. And that is a report that is it's there uh, in the probe. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we have to interrogate as we discussed it, because debt per se may not be the issue, like I said, because mm -hmm. countries borrow, countries have used debt to develop, countries have used debt to uh, transform the lives of their people. The question here is, then for us, why are we borrowing? Why are, mm -hmm. Yes, why are we borrowing? What are we using that money for? And I think when we answer that, then these other issues become secondary issues. Absolutely. Well, Christine, uh, besides overtaxing Ugandans, what are some of the measures that uh, the government can employ to reduce on the continuous borrowing? Well, uh, me personally, I've always, like I always preach, and like I said, I'm always for frugal spending, for, for, for you know, uh, utilization and proper management of debt. If we are to tighten, if we are, for example, I like where the, the, the new PSST is going, he says if a project is not ready, in other words, if there is no counterpart funding that is available for this project, we are not releasing the money. So for a project to take off, those things of planning and ETC feasibility studies should have been done even before the, the loan is disbursed. Yes. Uh, if government counterpart funding is not yet there, then you wait. Yeah, and that is the way to go. Other than what he talked about, of you know, you contract the loan, and then you remember you do not have uh, mm -hmm. the the counterpart funding, mm -hmm. and then the compensations are not yet there for the project affected persons, and these are some of the things that have all have have previously mm -hmm. led to growth in debt. Yeah, mm -hmm. so if we check this, I think we will be there. That is a pledge to uh, reduce the non-concessional borrowing still that is the commercial borrowing i like what he said about uh, engaging the donors the, the the people that give us the money, the money. but uh, unfortunately and for uganda but also the regional peers uh, we have moved towards non-concessional non-concessional you have your china that as an example they will not look at the human rights, you know, uh, mm. records and ETC, environmental, before they give you this loan. And that's why I talked about the people or the technocrats that are acquiring this debt for us on our behalf or negotiating on Uganda's behalf. behalf yes. When you're faced with such a creditor who is profit-oriented and motivated, and as long as they have, uh, you know, a promise that you'll pay, or you know they have you know they have uh, they know you have your oil they know you have your airports and then you have to mortgage them. The auditor general came up in 2020 and and noted that we were increasingly waiving our immunity over Ugandan assets both within and outside the country, all in the name of debt. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're faced with uh, all such you know uh, manner of you know challenges and etc, how then? Are we going to get out of this? Can we please strengthen? Because we are, yes, we are indeed attractive. Because <laughs> <laughs> to lend to, <coughs> because of the resources that you have, if they know they can come, and you know, if you fail to pay, there will always be this. Because as an example, like I said, most of the uh, East African countries have defaulted 
actually apart from Tanzania, the rest of the East African countries, the Uganda, Kenya, uh, your Burundi, your South Sudan, we are all above the 50% debt to GDP yeah. threshold. Yeah? Mm. Kenya is about 70. Rwanda mm. is about 72. Uh, Burundi Tanzania. is about 69. Mm -hmm. Tanzania is 38. This is very low. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So even as we violate some of these uh, protocols, the, the, the convergence criteria uh, for East Africa, why are we violating them? Can we get back to the table as, uh, as, as, as regional peers and see how we go about this? Is it possible, for instance, because there are cases where you find the same donor gives us different terms and gives Kenya, for instance, different terms. If you're borrowing from the IMF or wherever, mm -hmm. or China, they'll give us different terms. Our interest rates may be higher than the ones of Kenya. Why is that so? Is it possible for us to come together as a, a bloc and we negotiate the loans mm -hmm. together so that we have the same terms and favorable terms? For example, that is one of the things that we could explore. And so uh, mine really is still on the management of these resources. For as long as we are not managing these resources well, if we are dishing out uh, the, the, the tax incentives, you know, anyhow, if we are not supporting our very own, Roko is going down and we remember we want to borrow about 200 billion and to, to inject in this to buy shares in Roko. But we also have to look at uh, even as we invest, do we hope to recoup? Can we also support some of this? Because one of the reasons Roko is in that uh, situation is government owes Roko money. Are you paying your domestic debt? Yes. Is that too? Yes, because about six uh, about 600 trillion of uh, Roko's money is with government. The projects is with government. So even as you come and talk, are you paying your domestic, domestic debt? debt? Yes, mm -hmm. to enable them to, you know, be productive and stay afloat. Or rather, are you supporting the, the foreign companies, the investors? Penet. The expense, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the penet is. You know, a friend Coffee of here. mine always <laughs> told me, and this is where we come in with the push for the beneficial ownership law. We want it to come into into effect or into force as law. I know there is uh, something that is being done, but there are some companies, especially the big companies, uh, whose maybe uh, beneficial ownership information you do not know. We are talking mm -hmm. about Pinetti, but that is at the face value. Mm -hmm. uh, if you double click, like someone said, if you double click on Pinetti, who is there? Who do you find? Yeah. If you double click on Luboa, who do you find down there? And so all these are some of these issues that bring us to you know accountability, but also transparency. We need to be extremely transparent with how we utilize our debt. Can we, for example, uh, create a website for budget for debt information, like we have done the uh, budget dot 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 uh, dot ug? Uh, if we, for instance, uh, try to publish this information on debt, every whether it is year, whether it is every quarter, and we push out this information to the public. Yes, on dates. I think that is where we should be going, other than, you know, but also be uh, very keen and frugal. We want parliament, we want to see parliament perform their role, their oversight role. Mm -hmm. We do not want them to now uh, remember and do post mortem. It is good that the, the deputy speaker has actually uh, directed the National Economy Committee to find out, to compile all the loans that have been approved by parliament and give them what? Uh, an update. But why should it, the assumption is that that is their normal business, so they should always have it. Because uh, the risk with such kinds of, uh, whether it is an assignment or directive, is that it might come with another maybe 40 million shillings for each of the MPs to go to their, you know, and this will be increasing the bill, our mm. bill. And so, yes, we want to see more and more transparency, but we want to see even more um, 
better loan negotiation skills. If the, the, the loan negotiators that we have are not skilled, can we see how we improve their skill? Because the, 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 the donors are not sleeping. They are good. Because some of these loans are, demand, are not demand driven, they are supply driven. I come to you and I interest you in taking this loan. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Even when you don't need it, sometimes you find we have contracted loans that really we didn't need are not good for our economy, but mm -hmm. all the same we have contracted them. They are non-performing or they are poorly performing, mm -hmm. but the creditor is just looking at the profit. And so we need to be uh, more careful. I think, like he said, we have the resources. I think Uganda has money mm -hmm. to finance you know, our development. The only thing is about prioritization. Look at this 48 trillion budget, for example. Over fifty percent of it is is uh, consumptive. How much are you putting to develop? Back to develop, yes. Yes, you have this whole, you know, over five hundred MPs, over eighty ministers. The m amounts you're losing to corruption, and then these are also entitled to vehicles. The MPs, and you give them the, the these vehicles are going to be uh, repaired. They have oh, to be fueled, mm. and that is at your cost. You have not supported the private sector enough. And to make matters maybe uh, not worse, but to compound it all, you're not uh, setting the, 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 the environment for them to be able to mm. borrow mm. domestically, because we have seen government increasingly borrow, borrow domestically mm -hmm. and crowding out this private sector. Yes. And so we want to see some of these things being reversed. Okay. Yes. Well, Mr. Muhereza, as the team leader for the Youth for Tax Justice Network, how can the youth participate in, you know, the planning, uh, the sustainability, and of course, utilization of these uh, debts that we, that mm. the government borrows, as mm. well as, of course, repayment? Ah, thank you very much. Um, before I answer that, I wanted to reinforce um, about two things that she said. Mm. Um, one is about the harmonization in terms of uh, negotiating as a regional bloc, uh, because um, I think <laughs> there we get to have more power as Africa. And we could look at it either at a regional level in East Africa or even at a continental level. And I also don't want to believe what she said that mm. uh, for some that for some uh, lenders, uh, creditors like China, they cannot come to our terms. I usually joke that uh, these assets are, uh, they are not going to carry away an airport. So even if <laughs> <laughs> they are not going to carry away an airport, even if you've given it to them, even mm. if you've guaranteed to them, they are not going to wake up one morning mm. and say we are going back to China with Entebbe Airport. No, it's an asset, mm. it's there, it cannot. So I think we, we have most of that power within us as African governments to negotiate terms that benefit our people. And because of the same, the oil is not going to magically get out of the ground if the Ugandan government does not accept for it to get out of the ground. Yeah. They are not going to take any assets without us giving them those assets mm -hmm. or without us agreeing that they take those assets. And even if we told them to take them, they are not going to take them. <laughs> like I said, they are not going yeah, to carry an airport. Mm -hmm. They are not going to do so. So some of these things, I think, and it goes back to the harmonization that we've talked about. We can come together as a regional bloc. We harmonize on the way we negotiate our debt on what um, we borrow money for. Is it infrastructure? Is it uh, addressing market failures? Is it? And we should also do the same for tax because we, we would want to look at it at, as the same uh, two different sides of the same coin. That if you're not raising enough resources uh, through fair taxation, then you may have to borrow uh, for your development agenda. So, so those are the two things I thought I should emphasize that oh, as yes. African governments, we have the power to negotiate better terms. It won't matter whether uh, someone is in the Paris Club, whether it's a vulture fund, whether it's China. If we said we do these things we want to do for the death that we want to do, I think we... Then the other thing about, um, and again, me, I want to go away from the numbers. When we say 54%, uh, because what usually happens is that once we are almost reaching uh, those limits, uh, what countries usually do, they just rebase their economies, they say. Now our economy expanded. So now we have more room to borrow. That's what Uganda did a few years ago. I think 2012? Mm -hmm. I think something like that. Mm -hmm. so you, you just rebase mm -hmm. your economy and then you just say, 
okay, our economy is now bigger, so we can now borrow more. So for me, it now goes back to the question you asked, what do young people they need to do um, to participate in these processes? First, it goes back to the issue of oversight, of representation. There is no loan that passes without parliament approving it. So the, 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 the buck starts and stops with parliament. For any and it, like she said, we should have that cost benefit analysis. Well, I remember there was a time we had, I think, we borrowed about a hundred million, over a hundred million uh, USD to teach people how to wash their hands. Um, I think it was within Ministry of Health. And the question would be, why would we be borrowing money to teach people how to wash, wash their hands? hands? Yeah. I think it was something to do with hygiene and all that. So. Again, these are political processes. I mean, this is where I usually tell young people that for an MP, we should put fire under their feet to tell us why they approve certain loans that they approve, why they don't approve it, or why they don't even do the simple things of oversight. I remember there was a time we, we engaged the Committee on Finance uh, around loan negotiation and oversight. And they said uh, that is a function of the executive. So mm -hmm. uh, I remember the, the former chairperson of that committee is now a minister in, in finance. Um, but he, they said, you know, for us, that is a function of the executive. We cannot inject ourselves as MPs uh, in negotiation of loans, in what, and mm -hmm. then. So, and that was the finance committee, the committee that ideally would be able to. Uh, so, so it could also be an issue of capacity that people do not know that actually mm -hmm. they have the capacity or the ability or the power, the mandate to approve or disapprove loans, but also to follow up, to, of, to have the oversight role. So, so, so um, as young people, besides putting political pressure, and this one is saying we harass our leaders. Okay, let me use, I don't know if that is, we, <laughs> harass. we harass them to make sure that the decisions that they make are not going to impact us um, in a lot. Because it's, it's a matter of politics. This is where resources are allocated, this is where resources are. The, you decide uh, who gets what and where. Then secondly, as um, young people, and this I think would go across, not even just Uganda, we need to have that build that movement where we say um, we empower our governments to work as one to harmonize um, and when you harmonize by the way and you come as you can even I remember there is a certain phrase where I say that Africa can even uh, default purposefully you can say and there are certain countries that have tried it and creditors had to renegotiate Ecuador um, tried it Argentina tried it and creditors had to come and renegotiate. Go back to their, yes. yes. Go back to the table and say, instead of not paying anything, can we have better terms? And I think this comes, of course, they were squeezed a little bit because they were just doing it as individual countries. But imagine if East Africa just said, for this particular loan and this, because like she said, if it's supply driven, it means that uh, you know that, for example, I don't have the capacity to use that money, but you still give me the money. So if we can come up as young people, to make Africa the rule maker, not the rule taker, to say for any money that we are borrowing. And this, again, is through all the political processes that we, uh, that we undertake. Whether it be, of course, for, 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 for date, it's mainly at national, uh, national level, that's parliament, where they approve. But there's also date that we get through uh, state agencies, you know, they go. There's date that yes. we accrue through guarantees that we give. Mm -hmm. There is uh, because for us we are looking at just the date that we we go and we borrow, but there is also <laughs> date that state agencies go uh, and mm -hmm. yes and attract mm -hmm. some of those things. So, me I think the biggest cry um, are two things. One, we should participate in political processes actively, harass our leaders to make sure that okay harass maybe is the wrong word, but mm -hmm. to put them to account to say that um, <coughs> their contract date for our benefits and to also change the policy of contracting debt just for infrastructure to having debt because we will have the infrastructure but we cannot use it Anything as people. We've borrowed it. money yeah. to build dams for example but people's yaka meters are still beeping. I don't know which house I've not gone to and well, Mr. Mayor, in the interest of time, because uh, we are running a little bit out of time, as we wind up, what are some of you know your closing remarks? 
Uh, my closing remarks are two things. One, that uh, we are not against debt. Um, we are just saying that we should be clear on why we borrow, from whom we are borrowing, and then what we use uh, those resources for. Are they for us? or are they to benefit a few people? I think once we solve that, then um, everything else uh, becomes just uh, by the way. Then secondly is that uh, actually Uganda has the money that it needs to finance its development agenda. We just need to uh, interrogate, we just need to um, put policies within uh, uh, revenue mobilization. I, I, there is a domestic resource mobilization strategy. Mm -hmm. We just need to implement that strategy to have a comprehensive policy on tax incentives who pays who doesn't pay why don't they if we've forgiven people 10 years do we review at the five-year mark to say you said you would give us jobs you said you would do this if they are not there can we so that we don't lose out on all that money and then lastly lastly of course is to tell young people that um, the first bit is to participate in these processes the budget allocation processes, that's a cycle that's, that's there every year, meaning that every September that budget process starts and it ends around May the following year. Can young people from local government, national level participate? But also for, for in, in regional, in regional, in a regional context, at whether it's Iyala, whether it's East Africa, whether it's uh, the Africa African Network Trade um, Area, can we come together and harmonize our tax systems harmonize our negotiation around debt and other economic uh, agreements so that as a, as a continent we become a, a rule maker and not a rule taker. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Well, Ms. Uh, mm. Mrs. Christine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to just emphasize the point on public participation. Uh, we really, I would really want to encourage the public citizens out there to get interested in some of these uh, debt uh, issues. Some of the jargons are complicated, but they can always be simplified for them. But also to encourage the Ministry of Finance, but also government, to be transparent and to share information on debt with the public so that they are able to participate from an informed point of view. Uh, but also to note that uh, um, some of, for some of these loans, because if people have the information on loans, for example, the, the, the 10 million euro loan that we talked about earlier, the people would naturally ask, this loan was acquired, what happened? Where is it? We don't see the infrastructure on the ground. We don't have to wait then for the MPs and ETC okay. to come and first, you know, ask what happened. It was acquired 20 years ago, or 10 or 5. You know, we want to see things moving. The transparency is there. The value for money is there. The service delivery is there, has improved. I think that is one way that uh, we'll be able to benefit from these loans but also to, to encourage government to always adhere to its policies, to the laws and policies on debt acquisition and management. and management. If the constitution says parliament must approve every loan, why are you, give, why are you acquiring loans without parliamentary approval? approval. Yeah? And then they have, it somehow has to always leak in the media. And then that is when parliament gets wind of it and says, by the way, you didn't acquire approval, first come back, you know? And then we get it's back too into late. The step, yes. But also finally, uh, about the supplementaries, I also know that PSST has uh, stood his ground and I hope he will maintain it, it must be hot that no more supplementaries, Budget, yeah. and which is good because supplementaries are not good practice for us. They have pushed our debt up, you approve supplementaries, you do not have the matching funding for them, mm -hmm. and that is where we end up in problems. Okay, well, yeah, thank so. you, Mrs. Christine, uh, Diri Njiro, and Mr. Alan Muhereza for joining us uh, this morning on Sunrise at Sea. Thank you. Too. Well, that's Thanks. all we had for you this morning on our Twitter jobs too, as we looked at the conversation about the Uganda's burden debt. My name is Priva Elibaz. Coming up is our wellness, beauty, and lifestyle segment, and Agi Wase is going to be having the conversation about diabetes. This is Sunrise at Sea. Don't blink.